everybody. This is uh, the fifth of our six inaugural webinars being brought to you by the CCL Agricultural Action Team. Um, my name is Jan Storm. And, and just to let you know that um, the goal of these webinars are to help inform all of CCL volunteers that have an interest um, about how how to listen we need to listen to those that are in the agriculture sector and we need to really pay attention to the content of what they're telling us so that we can speak to them in a language that is meaningful to them and uh, we found that this is one of the problems one of the barriers that we're having in in building relationships with farmers and other agricultural stakeholders so i think we've been doing a good job and i think that um Probably tonight, most of you that have been listening to the to these webinars, I think you have a good sense now that carbon farming is like a it's like a win 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 uh, solution. It wins for farmers economically. It wins for the planet because we extract carbon, you know, and it wins in terms of affordability uh, because carbon extraction and storage is a lot cheaper than technological extraction. Um, but what you may not appreciate is that the capacity of forests to actually extract and store carbon is a lot bigger, actually, than the capacity of agriculture. And so tonight, we are going to hear about that from Jad Daly. Um, he's going to talk to us about the power, the role of forests and forest products in absorbing and storing uh, carbon. And uh, he's going to let us know about the, the negative emissions. Jad has worked in on forest conservation for more than two decades, including authoring federal legislation to benefit forests and co-founding what's called the Forest Climate Working Group uh, in 2007. And this working group brought together diverse interests from forest landowners and manufa manufacturers to conservation, government, and academic organizations to work on behalf of forests and climate change. This group is active today. Um, and we're gonna hear all about it, I think. Um, and so with that, I'd like to turn it over. I, I wanna thank Chad very much and I'd like to turn it over to you. Great, uh, thank, thanks so much, Jan. And, and, and before diving in, I just wanna, I wanna tip my cap to the Citizens Climate Lobby. I am a huge, huge fan of the work that you all are doing. Um, and for me, it starts with the fact that uh, you're sitting here at eight o'clock at, uh, at night Eastern time. I know there are folks from all across the country, um, but I've, I've done a lot of work um, as a paid professional in the conservation field, and I've done a lot of volunteer work. I was the president of an all volunteer land trust at one point, and I know what it's like to go home at the end of your work day and then go to do this kind of work uh, as well as a volunteer. And so I'm just, so grateful and so impressed with how many people in Citizens Climate Lobby are giving so much um, to be a, a voice on climate change. And, and I have been saying to people for months now, I feel like uh, Citizens Climate Lobby is the most effective group right now working here in Washington, D.C. to change the conversation um, on climate change, not just to work within the boundaries of how things are currently constructed, but really to change the conversation. So thank you for for everything that you're doing. And, and I think that, I hope by the end of this presentation, you're gonna feel like forests are the kind of bridge builder that I know that the Citizens Climate Lobby uh, looks for. Uh, you're great at, at finding common interests with people. And I think one of the things that we've always been excited about in, in the Forest Climate Working Group is that forests are naturally a bridge builder. People love forests and, and the kinds of things that we need to do to maximize the impact of forests, the beneficial impact of forests for climate change are things that in general, people really wanna do anyway. Um, and so there's just a lot of natural momentum um, and a lot to like naturally here. And I think for you all 
in the kind of relationship building that you're trying to do. I hope that you're going to hear some things tonight that make you feel like, wow, I could really see a member of Congress, uh, for example, getting very excited about that or some of my fellow citizens. Let me just say a word about American Forest. Not a, this is not a presentation about, about my organization. I just started at American Forest about five months ago. Um, but just, just so you know where, uh, where I sit every day, uh, American Forest is actually the oldest conservation organization in America. It was founded back in the 1870s. Um, and among its various accomplishments, actually created the U.S. Forest Service, uh, passed a lot of the, the really kind of groundbreaking laws that created public lands in America and determined how we take care of public lands in America. And, and our primary uh, work in my current organization is restoring forests, uh, particularly forests that have been damaged by fire or disease or other kinds of costs. We do the kind of work like you see that picture on the right, in this case, uh, restoring uh, white bark uh, pine forests, which by the way, one of the things that's killing off white bark pine forests across high elevation areas of the West is climate change. Well, one of the reasons that I made the move to American forests five months ago is that for now over eight years, I have been the, the co-chair um, of something called the Forest Climate Working Group that um, I, I co-founded back in 2007 with a colleague um, who shared the vision that the entire U.S. forest sector, from folks who own land, uh, just as Jan said, folks who, who uh, manufacture forest products, folks who care about conservation and wildlife and water and other kinds of natural values, academic institutions, government agencies, folks who are interested in the financial opportunities and carbon markets, all these people had a real shared interest back in 2007 uh, in the role that U.S. forests could play uh, in, in solving climate change. Um, and yet in the run-up to developing federal climate change legislation in the early, early days of the Obama administration, uh, U.S. forests weren't really very central in the picture. As a matter of fact, for example, agriculture got a lot more attention at that time even though it's a much smaller piece of the equation in terms of carbon emissions uh, reductions, um, because farmers are seen as more politically influential in some cases than forest owners. And so our, our job really was, first of all, to, to really capture the science and make the case for what role could forests play, and then what do we need to do about it? What do we need the federal government to do about it? What do we need states to do about it? And all other sorts of government agencies as well as what should all of us in the private sector, including citizens, be doing uh, to, to use forests as a, as a tool to address climate change. And so I just wanna talk about a couple of forest climate basics um, that, uh, that I, for us were really the kind of foundation that we built under this really uh, exciting collaboration that you know, here we are eight years strong and we've still got this incredibly diverse cross-section of organizations that are all working together. And, and this, is, this is, I think, in some ways, the most important uh, slide, one of the couple most important slides for you to remember. So, so U.S. forests and forest products every year, and I'll talk a bit about the role of forest products in storing carbon, but U.S. forests and forest products uh, capture and store about 855 million metric tons of carbon uh, each year. And you might recall the EPA Clean Power Plan, which was really the centerpiece of the Obama administration's climate strategy. It made up about half of the reductions that we were taking to Paris back in 2015. And as you can see, it's just about the same amount as what we're getting out of our forests. And so that hopefully gives you some sense of scale. The, the, the percentage changes a little bit from year to year, but essentially it's about 14% of U.S. carbon emissions every year are sequestered by U.S. forests. Um, and we think that's a really huge and important number. But what's really amazing about it is that there's new science that suggests that we could actually make that number far, far greater. The latest was a study that came out last week that suggested that forests and other natural lands could end up being 37% of our carbon reductions that we need to see. The Obama administration, at one of its last acts, uh, created a strategy that suggested that forests could provide about 30 to 50% by mid-century of our carbon emissions reduction. So this is a big, big piece of the puzzle, 
And most people feel that we pretty much can't get it right on climate change if we don't get it right on forests. And I'll talk in a bit about, about some of the things that are pulling us in the other direction and maybe undermine some of that power. Okay, a couple of other basic things to understand is that not all trees are created equal when it comes to storing carbon. And if you look at those numbers over on the right, you're gonna see a really wide range um, of how much carbon is stored per acre or per hectare um, by different forest types. And so all forests have something to offer when it comes to carbon, but there are real differences. And it's just important to know that, um, both so that we know where are we gonna get the biggest impact for carbon. This is kind of part of how you, you figure that, um, that out. But also one thing that we always say about forest and climate change is there's no one sit, a size fits all solution. Each one of these different forest types requires a little bit of a different strategy. And, and that can be frustrating for people who just want one simple answer. Uh, what do we do? And the answer is, well, tell me where you are. <laughs> tell me what kind of a forest you're working in and what condition it's in, and then we can go from there. Um, and so that nuance is really important to understand. So one of the things that might surprise you is this isn't just about those glorious, beautiful landscapes I've been showing you some pictures of. Urban forests are a big piece of getting it right on climate change. Here's a statistic that might really surprise you. There's 190 million acres of national forests in this country. And you can probably picture the national forest at least somewhat, you know, in these big blobs around the country. There are 130 million acres of urban forests around the country, woven in around our cities and towns. So almost as many really, you know, say two thirds at least, as many urban forests uh, acres of urban forests uh, as we have of national forests. And that gives you some sense of scale. So first of all, there are a lot of trees in these cities and towns and they, they capture, they naturally sequester about 10% of that big chunk of carbon reductions that I showed you earlier. Um, so let's call it a roughly a percent and a half a, a year of, of our overall national emissions are being sequestered by urban forests like this one. But here's the other part that doesn't get captured in that number, is the energy saving that comes from urban trees. You put a tree next to your house in the right orientation and it can cool the indoor temperature by 10 degrees. Uh, an urban heat island, those areas where you don't have any trees in cities can be five to seven degrees hotter during the day and 22 degrees hotter at night. And so with that, all that means is a lot of extra energy use or saved energy use depending on how we deploy trees across our cities. And you can see some of those numbers over there on the right from the US Forest Service. And those are huge numbers in terms of energy savings and therefore carbon emissions reductions that we get when we put trees back into our city. So just a little bit more here about some of the basics. You might wonder uh, of, of, of all those forests, how are they distributed around the country? Um, and what you see here is a national carbon map that was developed actually by my former employer, a group called the Trust for Public Land. It's a really neat online mapping tool that'll be available in a few uh, months so that any person can go and zoom around the country and figure out where is this forest carbon anyway uh, around me. But essentially, as you look at the map, the, the most important thing to know is the darker green areas are, are where you have the highest concentrations of forest carbon. Maybe not surprisingly in places like the Pacific Mountains, uh, where you have some of those giant, giant trees I showed you pictures of earlier. But you might be really su surprised to find, for example, that the upper Midwest, um, we all understand a really politically important area for climate change, has some of the most carbon rich forests in the country. Uh, in fact, in terms of private forest land, the most carbon rich forests in the country are in Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Michigan. So tuck that one away as you're thinking about uh, political bridge building and opportunities that might come uh, related to carbon-rich forests. And really across the entire uni eastern United States, as you can see, really every state has um, some pretty significant uh, uh, forest land with, with real carbon values. So this is a, this is a slide, and um, I, I, I promise I won't ask you to understand the graph at the top. It confuses even professionals. So I'm just gonna tell you what it says. And basically what this graph says at the top is that we're living right now in a really good period for forest carbon. A lot of key forest areas in the, in the United States, particularly in the East, have been growing back for a long time, for 100 years. 
Um, and our forest health has generally been on a, an upward trend for most of that 100 years. But things are starting to change. Um, and in particular, things like these super fires that we're seeing in the West. Huge new pest infestations like the hemlock woolly adelgid and the emerald ash borer that are sweeping across our forest. Just a simple grinding impact of climate change. You know, trees are adapted to a particular climate. And when the climate changes too quickly, the trees don't, don't uh, adapt very well. So all sorts of forest health challenges across the country. And then furthermore, with our growing population, we're projected to lose tens of millions of acres of forests to development uh, in the decades ahead. And so essentially what you need to know is that while we're getting this great carbon benefit from our forest today, that could completely disappear within the next few decades. And some parts of the country could actually, the forest could actually turn into a source of carbon if we, if we don't take action. And so imagine trying to reach our carbon goals if you have to add another 14% of emission reductions we have to find from somewhere versus doubling or tripling the amount of carbon reduction we're getting from forests. This is the swing voter in climate change. And so as we think about what we have to do, it's both about uh, increasing carbon stocks, but also dealing with these kinds of threats and stresses. Another example of, of, of a, a threat, but also an opportunity is we are still stripping forests away, not just for development, but for things like mountaintop removal mining that you see here. Uh, for agriculture, when, you, when agricultural markets boom and bust, forests uh, shrink and in, 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 uh, in, in, in result as land is taken back uh, into production. So there are a lot of former forests out there, um, mine lands that have never been reclaimed, agricultural lands that are no longer good for agriculture that have never been reclaimed as forests. And those are some of the biggest opportunity areas to get a whole lot of carbon back, uh, carbon storage back and sequestration where we're not getting any right now. Uh, so let's just, let's now let's shift gears. So those are some of just kind of the basics of understanding what, what's the opportunity that we're trying to capture, what are the, and, but yeah, also what are the challenges that we're trying to overcome? Let's, let's talk about how we get to work. And, and this, is, this is the opportunity for action that we want to present to people and that, that uh, you have a chance to talk to folks in, uh, in, in uh, political power about. So this is the second most important slide or tied with the other one I showed you as hopefully something that you'll remember. Um, in terms, of, I talked about the overall uh, sort of power of, of our forests and sequestering carbon. Um, this is the what we do about it slide. Uh, and, and it's kind of confusing. So I've come up with a way of thinking about it, which is thinking about playing offense and playing defense, if you're a sports fan at all. Playing offense is things like planting trees on former agricultural land. The, the project that you see there on the upper left uh, is uh, in the lower Rio Grande Valley. Um, where my organization and a number of others have been going in and taking these uh, really poor agricultural lands and replanting them with these uh, wonderful uh, Texas thorn scrub forests that are some of the best wildlife habitat anywhere in North America. So that's an offense opportunity. You go from ag these barren agricultural lands that are giving you virtually no carbon sequestration and all those trees that you see in those white tree tubes are going to be um, sucking up carbon uh, for years and years to come. Another example of playing offense that might surprise you is using wood more widely in um, construction. Cement and steel, as you're probably aware, are very, very energy intensive materials to make. So imagine the difference when you trade in steel beams and cement uh, you know, uh, flooring uh, with a wood model like this. Uh, where the material you're using is actually storing carbon. So as we harvest that forest in and into these long-lived wood products, we're actually storing the carbon uh, in that wood. And then we're replacing this very energy-intensive building material uh, with this carbon storage. And there's a lot, there are a lot of exciting things happening, finding new ways um, to expand the, the kinds of buildings that we can actually use wood in. And this is seen as one of the biggest opportunities to, to again, to play off in it. Now on the defense side, two things. The, the map that you see in the upper right corner there, it's actually a map of that same area that I'm showing you that we just replanted, uh, uh, in fact, this past weekend uh, on the left. And, and what the red areas that you see there are, are the developed areas and the green are the former remnants of forests. 
and then the tan are the agricultural lands that used to be forest. The whole region used to be forest. And so the tan lands are the kind of, you know, the, the ag lands that either are going to go into development or back into forest. And so that is just one small example of the land use battleground all around the country in terms of how much land are we going to conserve uh, from development and how much of that conserved land are we going to put, in some cases, back into forest or protect and manage as forest into the future. Um, but that, that, those land use questions are a critical part of how we play defense uh, for, for our natural lands and, and the forests that we do have. And then on the, on the lower right uh, is another one that might feel a little bit surprising, maybe even counterintuitive in this case, which is that sometimes the way that you defend carbon in forests is by taking a little bit of carbon out of it. There are a lot of places in the Western United States in particular where the forests have become incredibly overgrown. They've been managed in a certain way that they're building up these fuel loads that build to a point where when they have a fire, it's not just the fires of old, but the fires are so intense, in some cases, they actually melt the soil into stone, where literally nothing will ever grow there again without help. Uh, and so those are the kinds of fires that are really, really bad in terms of carbon, and they're really, really bad in terms of future growth uh, of our forests. And so going in and actually doing some selective thinning um, to protect those older, healthier trees is a great way actually to protect the carbon that we already have in those, those trees. And if it's used the right way, that woody material can actually be used, for example, for biomass energy, um, which is a, you know, another a carbon winner if done the right way. And so that leads to this slide, which is surely the most confusing one that I'll, I'll show you tonight. Um, and I'm not expecting you to interpret this, nor will I even try to interpret it for you myself. But essentially what this is trying to communicate is that in any forest, there's carbon all over. There's carbon in the soil, there's carbon in the litter, the leaf litter and, and dead branches on the floor of the forest, there's carbon in the live standing trees. And so how we manage all of that carbon over years and years is a puzzle. And in every forest, there are different ways we can combine what trees we leave, what trees we harvest and put into those long-lived wood projects. What some, in some cases, some of that material might even become a new source of energy. How do we manage the soils, which are often overlooked as a huge source of carbon storage? Over half of the carbon in forests is actually in the soils. Um, so it's a, it's a really complex puzzle um, to figure out how to optimize forest management uh, and restoration for carbon. But that's just exactly what our organization, the Forest Climate Working Group, and lots of, of folks, universities and government agencies are all around the country and the world trying to figure out right now, how do we, how do, we do this the best way possible? So I wanna close by giving you just a few examples. Um, and and I, I chose a few examples, hopefully that are from places that, that might uh, have a particular resonance for you in terms of, the, of how do we build political bridges. So the, the strip that you see there on the absolute left side of this slide, that's a map showing the density of abandoned mine lands in the United States. And by the way, if I showed you this map across the whole country, there are more abandoned mine lands than I ever realized all across the country. It's actually not just in the Appalachian Mountains, which is where I've zoomed in here. Um, but there are abandoned mine lands in the Ozark Mountains and all throughout the West. And a lot of these lands are like that picture that you see there in the middle. It's dead land. Basically, after mining, all of the stone was just pushed back into the shape of a mountain in such a way that nothing can grow there again. At best, you know, some, some uh, grasses and undesirable uh, tree species. And so what we've been doing is going in in partnership with the U.S. Forest Service and others and actually ripping up uh, those, uh, those compacted lands, it's the, the technique called deep ripping, uh, which is the only way that you can get what you see there on the right, which is a native red spruce. Uh, that's a forest of the future uh, that's been replanted on those abandoned mine lands. So when I went to the, I went to the CCL um, meeting this year in DC back in June, which was one of the most exciting events I've ever been to. And, and I went to the session on, on West Virginia, on coal country. Uh, and I heard people in that meeting talk about what they cared about. And in particular, there are a lot of folks from West Virginia who were talking about what they cared about. And they talked about, they, including folks who were coal miners, that they love the land. They love being out on the land. 
Um, and so when you think about this as a job opportunity for those folks, for what's next after coal mining, this is still being on the land. This is still uh, working with the land of Appalachia. It's just a different, it's a different product you're talking about now. It's trees instead of coal. And I just feel like that's a, something that has huge opportunity for connecting with the people and the culture of those places. And my experience has been in talking to uh, very conservative members of Congress about this work. They think it's really exciting. They really understand why this makes sense for those communities. So one other regional example I'm going to, I'm going to give you is um, from the lower Mississippi. This is something I've been kind of crazy about now for eight or 10 years. I, I just think this is one of the most interesting stories in America. So if you look on the upper, upper right of the screen, that, that is the lower Mississippi alluvial valleys, that kind of fluorescent green in the middle of it. 24 million acres, and it basically used to be like the Amazon forest. You go all the way to the right, that's the before picture and also the after picture, but, it's, it's, but it all used to look like that. These, these amazing flooded forests with just birds everywhere and all sorts of cool species right in the middle of our country. Um, and then we uh, you know, did a lot of uh, changing of the hydrology of this landscape. We cleared the vast majority of it for agriculture. And so by 1992, you were down to less than 6 million acres, less than a quarter of these, of the North American Amazon, you know, less than, less than a quarter of it left in the middle of our country. And it just so happens that those forests in that area, because of the types of soils and the types of the trees, are some of the most uh, powerful for sequestering carbon, that 320 to 350 tons of carbon per acre that you can capture in those forests. So uh, there are a lot of great organizations that are now going out, and again, they're buying up some of these marginal agricultural lands, particularly the ones that are close to the, the waterways that flood all the time anyway and aren't very good for agriculture, and going in and replanting um, these native bottomland hardwood forests. And, and there have been over a million acres of these forests uh, replanted, and uh, our organization and a number of others have been talking about a, a moonshot of doing another million acres in a very short period of time um, as a huge surge forward on carbon. And we've calculated that if you reforested another million acres um, of this landscape, it would have the equivalent carbon emissions reduction power over the, over the lifespan of those forests uh, as taking 91.6 coal-fired power plants offline for a year. And so then this is the last thought I want to leave you with, and I think this is really, really important, and it gets back, Jan, to something you said when we were all chatting before this started about how people hear, think about this work and receive this work. So I mentioned that when uh, in the ForestCon working group, when we started, when we started uh, engaging with members of Congress, uh, and other uh, folks back in 2008, 2009, um, it, you know, that U.S. forests were kind of not in the conversation in, in many key places. And um, from starting from basically a baseline of, of zero in some cases, we very quickly reached a point uh, where we had um, a component, a new component of the, the, the cap and trade bill that was uh, a program specifically designed to provide incentive payments to landowners who wanted to go out and do things like plant trees. Uh, and all the things that we've been talking about today that would be good for carbon, uh, saying, hey, we're gonna invest in that uh, as one of our strategies. And, and we worked with folks from all spectrum, the, across the political spectrum, it was sort of, our stuff was often the one thing that uh, important people in D.C. Would, would, would point to and say, hey, talk more about that, because every time you talk about it, people come together and they agree on something. Um, so I offer that to you, I, I hope, to, to be very encouraging. And those same ideas that we've been promoting since 2008 are, are still happening. California is still moving forward. They have a program. We just did a session with them a couple weeks ago. They're doing all the things that we have been suggesting now for eight years that the federal government might do to stimulate this kind of, uh, of activity. And there are other states as well that are starting to step into this space. And I will tell you behind the scenes here in DC, there are a lot of people on both sides of the aisle who are ready and waiting for this to be part of the conversation when they're, they're ready to step in on climate change. And, and so uh, we'd love to help you all in any way that we can as you're thinking about this. I wanna thank you very, very, very much. I think we'll be back in touch with you. Great. Well, thank you all so much for your time tonight. I really appreciate it.
hey, 